I have a friend, a lady, who got married and later discovered that her husband is impotent. After many years of praying and trying other means to get the man active, it didn't work. She finally divorced and got married to another man. And they now have many children. Has the lady sinned against God by getting the divorce? From yesterday's teaching concerning divorce, what if you marry a man or woman and later discover that the man is impotent or the lady has no vagina or undeveloped vagina? What do you do? Would it be wrong to get a divorce and marry another person? If you say nobody should get a divorce on ground of marriage by deception, what do you advise the other party to do? How can the problem be addressed? Hello, people of God. Welcome back to my channel. As we all know, the Bible is not in support of sex before marriage, and no Christian should indulge in fornication and other sexual sins. Therefore, many single brethren questions are how then can one know if one's potential partner is potent or has a functional wound? Some even ask about sexual compatibility. Here is a question from a sister that got to know her husband is impotent on her wedding night and needs solution to the big problem. Listen carefully to the answer given by the Remnant Christian Network relationship panelists as three of them give answers to the question. May God help every single brother and sister that are yet to decide on who to marry. My name is Olawale Amde Ogujobi, the admin of a Great Light Channel. This is the answer to the question. Watch and be blessed. This was Barista's teaching yesterday, but I want to throw light on this. I think I, he should be answering it, but I said, no, let me also say something. Listen. There are many aspects of everyday practice today that we may not find black and white answers from the scriptures. And that is why Jesus gave the church authority to bind some things here on earth that will be bound in heaven and some things that will be loosed here on earth and will be loosed in heaven. In Acts chapter 15, media give us Acts chapter 15 verses 28 to 30. There was one of such scenarios. There was a case that came up. They couldn't find a direct answer from the law or the scriptures that they were using at that point. Acts chapter 15 verses 28 to 30, what we popular, popularly refer to as the Jerusalem Council. And then the church came together. The church came together. And they took decisions on behalf of heaven. And, it situ and the decisions became binding on the Gentile, the Gentile church. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. That ye abstain from meat offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. From which, if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare you well. And in verse 30. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle. Now, I wanted to start with that scripture before I say what I want to say. So that we, if, we, if you don't understand this provision that God had, that has been made for the church, particularly in the locality, to take decisions over matters that you may not find direct black and white answers in the scripture. If you don't know this, then we may just keep arguing back and forth for nothing. A friend of mine was faced with a similar situation where he ended up marrying a lady who was HIV uh, positive and he didn't get to know until a marriage. How did it happen? When they went to do marriage tests, they were long distance relationships. Somebody asked a question on long distance relationship, they'll be answered very soon. When they, went, when they did a marriage test. He got his own HIV results, was negative. He called her and told her, I am HIV negative. Out of the excitement, he didn't wait to hear her own. He didn't ask her, how are you? And the lady too, deceitfully held her own result back. She was negative. I mean, she was positive. And they got into the relationship. And they got into marriage. The church joined them. Parents released them. But in the course of the marriage, frequent sicknesses began to 
erupt in the lady's life. Doctors ran all manner of tests. They couldn't decipher what was wrong until um, just hesitantly they said, let us run HIV tests and then discovered that the lady was HIV positive. The young man, out of a good heart, like Joseph of Nazareth, decided he was not going to put her away. We will continue like this. Let us see how we can manage the situation. Until one day, a friend, uh, his younger brother came around and the, this, the, the wife went into that kind of crisis again and the younger brother was a medical personnel and in an attempt to attend to, the, attend to the crisis, she was bleeding and he was using his bare hands to attend to her and the young man couldn't stand it again so he had to find a way to corner the, young, the brother and say, please, my wife is HIV positive. And the brother was mad at him. And you allowed me to, be, to get this close to death. And that was how the information was let out of the bag. The cat was let out of the bag. And the family came together. The church that did the wedding came together. And they decided, it was like this Jerusalem council situation, that a marriage that was entered into on account of deception from their own side, the person that they gave from their own side, because the church took place, the wedding took place uh, on, in, from the bride's church. So the parents came, had a family meeting and said, we apologize to you, young man, for all the pain our daughter has caused you. We apologize to you, in-laws, for the pain we have put your family to, through. We hereby return the bride price. And we retrieve our daughter. And the church said, we also re- we dissolve this marriage because a marriage that was entered into with deception never happened. This was, that's why I had to read the scripture for you. The church took a decision that this young man is free and innocent. Let him move on to remarry. So there, there's no time to say much about that. So this is just one case. So there are many of the kind of scenarios where elders of the church will have to come together and take a, a posture prayerfully and then answer your question. So that's it for, for me as a person. I am of the opinion that any marriage that is entered into with deception never happened. Because lie, lie, the Bible describes Satan as the father of lies. So if a woman lied to you that she had a vagina and you got there and you didn't see vagina, that woman is the daughter of the devil because the Bible describes the devil as the father of lies. Continuing to live with that kind of woman is to be married to Satan's daughter. He can visit your home many times. But that's my take anyway. So over to my fellow panelists in case you have anything to add. Well, it is quite controversial. It is a very, very controversial issue. And if we, we begin to delve into the various sides of this issue, I think today will not be enough. Well, I wanted to, to just make a quick one on that. Okay. Um, like evangelists have mentioned, because of how it is, what is most recommended is that we can't give a general rule, a straight jacket rule to some of these controversial issues. Each case must be looked into on, on its the merit own of basis. It and on this peculiarity. So when we have these kinds of questions coming up on open forum like this, because there are a whole lot of other things to address, the recommendation is that they should go and see a counselor. The counselor has the spirit of God and the wisdom to manage the case. Because some, I can fault the decision of that church on the ground that what if the man loves the woman? Both of them love each other. She won't, he, we have cases where both people loved each other so much that whatever has happened has happened and they want to continue with their life. You coming to dissolve his marriage against his will. Okay, he was willing to let go. But we really need to be sure that it's not pressure that got him to that point of willingness. No, because because there are a whole lot of... Let's not make marriage about sex or children. There are a lot of people that are married and there are a lot of disadvantages physically and they are living well with themselves. So, my recommendation would be that they should see a counselor. Yeah, because 
uh, one of the PowerPoint that I wanted to talk about that I couldn't have time is called jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is very, very vital in the issue of marriage, just like it is vital in court. And what is jurisdiction? Jurisdiction is the power of court to advocate on a matter. So that, for instance, if a subject matter is not within the capacity of a judge, of a court, and you say, I know this judge, so let's go, the two of us accept, we, the both of us, we agreed that um, maybe you were coming from Jalingo and I am coming from Lagos. So we say, okay, let, let the two of us meet in Makodi. The Makodi is more convenient for the two of us to meet so that Mama will judge our matter. The fact that we, the two of us agree does not give jurisdiction to the court. Even if the two of you agree, but by constitution, the court don't have power to decide on that matter. It is, it is void. And even if you continue until you are about to deliver judgment, an objection can be raised on ground of lack of jurisdiction. So when marriage is done, even the two of you that are married, the two of you, if, if, you, if the two of you agree that we should go your separate way, we are not fighting, no. whatever you want to take, take and go, whatever I want to take, take and go, let's agree to dissolve it. The fact that the two of you agree and dissolve it does not mean you are guiltless because you don't even have power to, the agreement of the two of you cannot give you power to dissolve because it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to God. So some of these things are very, very dicey and we cannot use an exception. There, there is a difference between an exception, we can't use an exception to determine a general issue. So some of those things are very dicey, but like Reverend Dan says, when it happens, go and submit yourself to, a counsel, to, to counselors, the elders of a church, not just an elder of any church, but where the Spirit of God is present and the counsel of God can be found. And of course, that is why it is also very important, like we suggest, submit yourself to screening, to test, all kind of tests, even if you need to, to visit a gynecologist to examine people and run necessary tests, let those tests be run, be carried out. Even if it needs mental to test the person, whether the person is mad or his, his brain is functioning well, all those things need to be done so that if the person is mad or something is, the person's brain is touching, and you are still convinced that God wants you to go into it. You are going into it with that information handy. And then maybe the mantle of deliverance is upon you. And God is seeking to bring a liberty to that person through that union. You are going with that motivation and mindset. But do all the, we recommend that you do all the tests that is necessary so that you are armed with sufficient truth. So that if there is a case of deception, and even if that deception is to be analyzed... It will be a deception that is a legitimate deception that cannot be captured by medical equipment or by psychological analysis so that you know that the deception was a deception indeed. Sorry, so, I, I just want to just add this, that the point the evangelist raised about the church dissolving that marriage, I want to stress it that during wedding, there is a clause that where there is deception, this union is not brought together by God, nor legitimate. There is a clause like that in the marriage proceeding of a wedding. That's why the church can pull that clause and implement it. So that you don't think that, ah, why would that church do that kind of thing like that? There is a clause during the wedding that has that so i just wanted to throw that in i think the panelists have done justice to the question here are some things you can do to avoid being in such situation it is better to learn some things from other people's experiences than being the victim one once you are engaged suggest yourself to all kind of medical tests medical science has made life better today to the extent that most health challenges can be reviewed both of you should go for all kinds of necessary tests needed to be done. Make sure you are going into the marriage with enough medical information. 2. Give yourself to the church marriage committee process. Many people of this generation don't want to come out clearly to the marriage committee again. These people have been graced to serve in this capacity. 
please trust them. Follow all the laid down principles of the church you are currently serving. Let them be fully involved in the process and you will be amazed at how much help they can provide both of you. 3. Let important people in your life get involved in the process. Important people like parents, pastor, mentor, covenant friend, etc. should be aware of your relationship and intention. These people will surely help both of you. In Proverbs chapter 11 verse 14, it says, When no cancer is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. 4. Be sensitive to the impulses of the Holy Spirit. The believer's greatest asset is the Holy Spirit. Anyone that follows his counsel can never miss the road. Human beings are limited. We can't see naturally beyond the physical. But the Holy Spirit can open up higher dimensions to a man if he works closely with him. Don't let the so-called love or lust make you reject the counsel of the Holy Ghost. No one on this earth is as wise as him and he knows all things. Value him and let him be your leader in all you do. Thank you for watching. May the Lord bless you and cause his face to shine on you. Amen. This is a great light channel.